Christianity is dying in Europe. Now see a country that thinks it's worth fighting for. You have to stick to your traditions and legacies. Plus, how Natalie Grant found her voice. It is amazing what happens. Without making a sound. Singing is what I do. It's not who I am. On today's 700 Club. Hello and welcome to the 700 Club. Charlottesville was lit by candlelight last night, less than a week after the city was illuminated by hundreds of torches. And while the people there are dealing with the aftermath of the racist riots, President Trump is facing more backlash over his comments. Mark Martin has the story. Hundreds gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia, Wednesday night for a march for peace, less than a week after a scene filled with hate and chaos. Participants held a candlelight vigil in honor of 32-year-old Heather Heyer, the woman killed when an attacker drove a car into a crowd of counter-protesters at a white nationalist rally. The vigil followed an emotional memorial service for Heyer. No father should have to do this. They tried to kill my child to shut her up. Well, guess what? You just magnified her. President Trump tweeted about Heyer, calling her beautiful and incredible and a truly special young woman. On CBN's Faith Nation Wednesday, one of the president's evangelical advisors, Pastor Robert Jeffress, blasted the white supremacy movement as demonic. He also said liberals are wrong when they accuse President Trump of supporting racism. There is an effort to do whatever is necessary to take this president down, and uh, they have painted, the media has painted, the liberals have painted a false narrative that the president is a racist, and any time he tries to break out of that box, uh, liberals aren't going to allow him to do it. I know the president, you know the president, there is not a racist bone in his body. And evangelist Franklin Graham said Satan is to blame for the racist riots, not the president. But the president's news conference comments on the violence in Charlottesville have sparked outrage across the country. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at, you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides. Corporate leaders protested by pulling out of Trump's business advisory councils. So the president has now closed down his economic panels. He tweeted, rather than putting pressure on the business people of the Manufacturing Council and Strategy and Policy Forum, I am ending both. Thank you all. The Charlottesville uproar has also led to efforts to remove symbols of the Confederacy in cities across the country. In Baltimore, the statues are already coming down. The mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, had workers cover the city's 52-foot Confederate memorial obelisk with wooden panels. And in Norfolk, Virginia, a large crowd gathered Wednesday evening at the Confederate monument for a peaceful protest. I'm here for to support equality. I believe in 2017 we've progressed so much as a society that we should not allow the freedom of speech to encourage hate and to produce hate. Many Christian leaders this week are calling for the church to lead the way in a country that needs reconciliation and healing. Mark Martin, CBN News. Well, it's obvious from what we've experienced in the last week that racism does exist. I think we've probably never heard more voices that are speaking out for inclusive, inclusiveness, for uh, appreciation, for making your voice heard without being violent. Violence begets violence. and. I would, on the heels of having said that, just remind you of the book that we featured earlier this week called The Smear by uh, journalist Cheryl Atkinson. Take a look at the book and be very careful where your focus is being redirected in the day that we live in. There's an agenda out there. Well, rumors of war with North Korea are subsiding for now, but the threat's actually still growing. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Terry. China and South Korea both say there will be no war with North Korea. The South Korean president saying, I can confidently say there will not be a war again on the Korean peninsula. And a top Chinese general is advising the U.S. to take military action off the table. He made the comment in Beijing at a meeting with the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Joseph Dunford says a military solution to the problem would be, quote, absolutely horrific, but he added it's unimaginable to allow Kim Jong-un to develop a nuclear warhead that could target South Korea. 
and the United States. Well, while North Korea has taken a step back from the brink of war, it seems the rogue regime may be buying more time. CBN News has learned Pyongyang could be close to an even more powerful weapon, posing an even greater future threat. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. As if the news out of North Korea wasn't bad enough, things might get a whole lot worse within the next 18 months. There's word that Kim Jong-un and his regime may soon develop a hydrogen bomb. I spoke to a Pentagon source last week that revealed to me that North Korea is anywhere from 6 to 18 months away from developing a hydrogen bomb. Harry Kazianis heads up the defense studies at the Center for National Interest. It isn't ludicrous to think that the North Koreans, even though their economy is one-third the size of Ethiopia, can do this. If you put in enough money, if you starve your, enough of your own people, you can build things like this. Kazianis says dictator Kim Jong-un claimed to have tested an H-bomb last year, but most experts dismiss that, arguing the North might have had a more powerful atomic bomb. An atomic bomb was the kind that dropped on Japan at the end of the Second World War. Well, experts say a hydrogen bomb uses nuclear fusion and can be far more powerful by a thousand times or more. If an H-bomb hit New York, the death toll could reach over 3.4 million. Now North Korea said it will launch thousands fold revenge against the United States for what it called America's villainous actions against our country and people, warning that if the U.S. thinks it will be safe because it's across an ocean, there is no bigger misunderstanding. The statement came after the U.N. Security Council unanimously approved tough new U.S. drafted sanctions, including a ban on coal and other exports worth over a billion dollars. These sanctions will cut deep. And in doing so, we'll give the North Korean leadership a taste of the deprivation they have chosen to inflict on the North Korean people. Pentagon officials say hydrogen bombs are heavier than a standard atomic device, so Kim would potentially need a more advanced missile than what he has tested so far to carry a larger payload to hit the United States. Unfortunately, North Korea seems to be working on such a missile known as the KN-08, a three-stage missile which some believe might be North Korea's next missile test. So what is our option? In the long term, what I think we do, we have to do punishing unilateral sanctions on Chinese banks and Chinese state-owned enterprises. Those are the real lifeblood of the North Korean regime. Experts say we cannot continue to deny what North Korea's military machine can accomplish. If we pretend it cannot happen, that's not only a bad idea, but it's almost a guarantee that it will happen. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Eric. Well, turning overseas, a new report reveals more Jewish Israelis visited the Temple Mount last month than any other in half a century. 3,200 Jewish vis visitors made the trek to the holy site. That despite escalating tension and violence after three Israeli Arabs killed two policemen in a terror attack. Israel had launched extra security measures at the Temple Mount to prevent more terrorism, but those measures were later relaxed after an intense backlash. Let's go back to Terry for more on this story. Thanks, John. Well, joining us now is our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief, Chris Mitchell. He's the author of the book, ISIS, Iran and Israel, What You Need to Know About the Middle East Crisis and the Upcoming War. Chris, it's great to have you Terry, with us. Terry, great to be with you. You know, the Temple Mount is always a bit of a confusion uh -huh. to me. There's always tension there. It seems to have relaxed itself a little right. bit yeah. for the moment. Mm -hmm. But what's the underlying issue there? I, I think the basic uh, underlying conflict is who's going to be in control of the Temple Mount? You know, it was 17 years ago today that I went with uh, Liz and our, our children to establish a news bureau there in Jerusalem. And uh, five weeks later, what's called the Second Intifada began. And the claim then was that the Al-Aqsa Mosque was in danger. It's the same claim now that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is in danger by the Jewish, uh, Jewish Israeli state. And, uh, but even though it's a false narrative, that's, uh, that's something that they, they continue to claim. And even 50 years later, after Israel finally took over the Temple Mount, after more than 2,000 years, that's still the issue. Who's going to be in control of the Temple Mount? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it, you know, you, that's the confusion of it. You mm -hmm. know that it's Israeli turf yes, in a sense, a, yes. but controlled by what seems to be going on on the other side. Right. Israel has sovereignty over the Temple Mount, but the administrative day-to-day -day activities are controlled by the Islamic Waqf. But the ultimate goal of many Muslims is to mm -hmm. reclaim the Temple Mount for themselves 
and uh, and that's the conflict. Well, Iran mm -hmm. seems to remain mm -hmm. the top threat right. to Israel and a lot of the world. Exactly. Uh, but talk a little bit about the recent conversation you had with former Congressman Frank. Uh, I just talked to him last night, uh, just outside of Washington D.C., and he talked about that Iran is the main. Uh, threat right now to Israel and right now there's a race for the ruins inside Syria after the Syrian civil war. Mm. Iran is pouring in men and machines and weapons to that area to try to reclaim that area. What they're trying to do is have a land bridge all the way from Tehran, from Iran, all the way to the Mediterranean. Once they do that, they can pour more men and munitions as and, and establish uh, military bases to threaten Israel. Now, Israel will have to do something to to uh, counter that. They may strike those bases. And if they do, that could lead to a direct war between Israel and Iran, which means that even though ISIS is being defeated, it could lead to a more dangerous season right now after the Syrian civil war. And one other thing that he told me, uh, 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 Terry, was the fact that many Christians right now Christianity is really at risk in northern Iraq, and it may uh, may suffer in the next six months if something's not done by the Trump administration and if the Christian church doesn't speak out in the West. Many of these Christians won't go back to the homes that had been destroyed by ISIS. Does speaking out make a difference? Yes, it does. Makes a big difference. In fact, many of the Christians over there say, why isn't the, Christ the church in the West speaking out more for us? And many times they feel abandoned because of what's happened in the last few years. Yeah. Well, their whole lifestyle's yeah. been threatened there. That's true. We thank you. I know next week we're going to have a report from you on some fascinating things about what's going on right. with the Dead Sea. So uh -huh. we'll look forward to that as exactly. well. It's always great to have you great here. Great to be thank with you, Thank you Terry. so much. It's like you come home. <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, the place in Europe where Christianity is making a comeback. Europe's legacy <laughs> is a Christian legacy, not necessarily in a religious form, but most definitely in a cultural form. Of course, not everyone is thrilled with this new development. CBN News is in Hungary with an exclusive report, and that's next. It's enough to make Americans jealous, and it ought to. A nation has rediscovered its Christian roots and has even rewritten its constitution to protect the family and the unborn. But as Dale Hurd reports from Hungary, European leaders are not happy about this renaissance of Christianity. In a time when most of Europe is in the grips of atheism, there is a nation where Christianity seems to not only be holding its own, but some say is thriving. Imagine a government that is unabashedly Christian, that thinks Christian values are worth defending, that wants to protect and even nourish the family. Welcome to Hungary. Hungary's constitution is explicitly Christian. It says that marriage is between one man and one woman, and that life begins at conception. It even includes the phrase, God bless the Hungarians. Hungary's faith church with 300 branches is one of the largest Pentecostal churches in Europe with 70,000 attenders. And the Hungarian government has taken on the role of protecting Christianity. It's even set up an office to help persecuted Christians worldwide. When CBN News brought to the world the story of Sweden's threat to deport Iranian actress Eideen Stranson back to Islamic Iran, only one nation stepped up and offered her asylum. Hungary. The Hungarian government says taking in persecuted Christians is our moral and constitutional duty. Hungary uh, wants to protect uh, the European values, the European Christian and Jewish values. Hungarian policy analyst Istvan Poda says Hungary has only returned to its roots as a historic bastion of Christianity dating back over a thousand years and despite almost 200 years of Muslim Ottoman rule and after World War II Soviet communist domination. Secretary of State Zoltan Kovacs. You have to stick to your traditions and legacies. Europe's legacy is a Christian legacy, not necessarily in a religious form, but most definitely in a cultural form. And it's this belief that has Hungary locked in a battle with the European Union over migrants. Mr. Orban has accused the EU of trying to Islamize Europe, and Hungary has infuriated Brussels by building a fence to keep illegal migrants out. The European Union is ticked because Viktor Orban has told Brussels to essentially take a hike when it comes to open borders. Hungary has seen the terrorism and chaos caused by migration in Western Europe and has said, not here. 
The European Union has even gone to court to force Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic to take in migrants. Mr. Orban has accused Brussels of blackmail. Securing the borders to stop illegal migration is indeed a solution. And this is the only way actually to reinstate law and order at the borders of the European Union, uh, not the other way around. Kovac says it matters that most of the migrants trying to enter Hungary are Muslim. And he says Western European nations are paying a heavy price by pretending that Islam doesn't matter. We've been living together or living close to uh, Islam for centuries uh, in the past, and we all know about it. So that's why it, it does matter who is coming and in what manner uh, people are coming. Orban is often portrayed in the Western media as sort of a version of Vladimir Putin, an undemocratic strongman. In fact, at an EU summit a few years ago, the European Commission president reportedly greeted Orban with the words, hello, dictator. Hungary is certainly not a dictatorship. But Orban's critics accuse him of corruption and using the instruments of government against his political opponents, including the recent billboard campaign against billionaire George Soros. What we see today in Hungary is the shameless use of public money, of tax money, to formulate pro-government messages. Since 2010, um, the Hungarian government has been continuously weakening the system of checks and balances in Hungary and weakening democratic institutions. But Orban, a man who even his critics concede is a skilled politician, doesn't have a serious political rival. He will probably remain in power, meaning Hungary's standoff with the European Union over migrants is likely to escalate. But it also means that Hungary will continue to have a government that thinks Christianity is worth protecting. Dale Hertz, CBN News, Budapest. You know, there is no perfect system, but Hungary does seem to have come to a place where it's willing to stand up and say, this is who we are, this is what we believe, and we're not changing that. You know, I think in some ways America has become like Esau. We're trading our inheritance for a mess of pottage. Well, up next, a wake-up call for Americans. We're addicted to sugar. Dr. Ian Smith tells us how it's hurting us and what can be done to stop it. Well, you may think your sugar intake is limited to just a spoonful here and there. Unfortunately, that little bit adds up. And according to Dr. Ian Smith, the average American consumes, get this, more than 150 pounds of sugar every year. And to make matters worse, that overindulgence is taking a toll on our health. Take a look. We have a love affair with sugar, but it's making us sick. Best-selling author Dr. Ian Smith says in order to feel better fast, we need to reduce our intake of these granular crystals. In his book, Blast the Sugar Out, Dr. Ian shares his five-week plan to reduce sugar and carb loads by eating simple, affordable foods. Well, Dr. Ian Smith is with us now, and welcome back to The 700 Good to be Club. Back. Thank you so How much. How big a problem is sugar? Oh, it's huge. It's everywhere. You know, 29, right, 29 point million people are diabetics, type 2 diabetics. 86 million Americans are pre-diabetic. That means that they're on the verge of diabetes and don't, most don't even realize they are. But the idea is that, we're, I'm saying to people, you don't have to eliminate sugar, but reduce some control of the sugars. It. Control the yes. sugar, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, what does it do to our bodies when we eat it? Ian? You know, it's interesting. So sugar is important, actually. We actually need sugar. It's a great source of energy. It's the number one source of energy for our brain. Our muscles need it. Um, so we need sugar. But when you have too much sugar, you can't yeah. process it. It affects your blood vessels. It affects your heart, your eyes. I mean, it causes cardiovascular disease. You, you know, saw this firsthand with your grandmother. Tell us how this whole thing sugar thing yeah initiated so my grandmother you. was a type 2 diabetic I was a first-year medical student and um, we didn't I, didn't I didn't know medicine at that time and there she is right there I miss Graham and um, and so we she got this diagnosis we were so scared we thought it was a death sentence because we, she has sugar so diabetes. So type two is when you're di diagnosed as an adult. Yes, yes. Life. Well, mm -hmm. kids now unfortunately have it, but it, it's it's not type one. Type one is a genetic issue where, ah, okay. where you're not making insulin. But so my grandmother had it, and I said, well, I started reading real fast, and they what I read back then. This is a long time ago. Was exercise and reduce your sugar content. So I said, I said, Graham, let's join the gym. Now here's this old black lady from the south. 
who had never worked out in her life. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. She said, she said, Graham said, okay, let's do it. After two weeks, she went to her doctor, and her doctor said, what are you doing? She said, why do you say that? He said, your blood sugar Come levels on. have been cut in half. Really? And she said, well, my son, grandson's had me in a gym, and I'm cutting my sugar. So it worked. Wow. It worked. And so when I decided to attack sugar this year, because so many Americans don't realize how much sugar they're consuming and mm -hmm. how it's affecting their body, I decided to go back to the old basics of my grandmother, which yeah. is increase your exercise, but reduce the bad sugars. Still have sugar, mm -hmm. by the way, because there are natural sugars, right? There's yes, fruit, there's say, vegetables, yeah. there's milk. Those are all good sugars. But let's reduce some of these added sugars. Yeah. Well, you've created a five-week program, yeah. and I want to get into that, but sure. let's start by talking about sugar consumption because you said, and I think it's true, most of us don't realize how much of the bad sugar we're getting. Oh, my goodness. So the average American consumes this much sugar, oops, sorry, this much sugar in the course of a day. Okay. In the course of a the, day. About three quarters of a cup. In the course of a week, three pounds of sugar. Wow. In the course of a month, 13 pounds of sugar, which makes 156 pounds of sugar for the year, and 66 of those pounds are added sugars. That's what we're, we're worried about. It's yes. the added sugars that we're putting out of the table or in processed foods. And that's the stuff that's addicting, right? Oh, my goodness. So sugar's addictive because when you consume it, it release, releases a chemical called dopamine in your brain, which is a happy chemical. We like that. We yeah. like that, right? <laughs> so the more sugar you eat, the more dopamine you release, yes. the more sugar you want. And so we're trying to break, so this book will help you break that addiction. I wanted to show here, by the way, this one I want everyone to take with you. If you want to be able to see how much sugar you're consuming, take the number of grams of sugar. Here it is um, 39, uh -huh. uh, 38. So take the number of grams of okay. sugar, divide it by four, that will tell you how many teaspoons of sugar are in one serving of that particular product. Are you kidding me? So almost 10 teaspoons just in this one soda. Wow. Boom, 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 boom. So this is why this book is so important. So people need to know all these sugars are in there. Let's start your program, yeah. week one. So week one is calibration. So the idea is let's see where you are mm -hmm. and let's slowly reduce the sugar. So you can have regular foods, by the way. You don't have to just eat diabetic foods. So yes, there's French toast, but there's real maple syrup and there's some really? berries. Yes, it's all about portion size. Look at the size. It's not five slices, right? right? It's a mixture. Um, so the idea is with calibration the first week is let's hit the reset button and get you reducing sugar yeah. and doing the Don't right thing. Don't shock it, just Don't shock it. it, exactly. Okay, week two. Yeah, week two. Now this is a veggie burger. The idea is you're gonna be able to have regular foods. So week two is called focus because most people actually go off of a plan on week two. Week one they get through, Week two tends to be tough. So now we're focusing on making sure that we're eating better, we're taking a little more sugar out, we want more color, we mm -hmm. want more fiber, and you will have some what we call power-ups. Now your power-ups are things that are in the book in case you didn't have enough to eat, you mm -hmm. need a little boost of energy, you can have some of the power-ups or all the power-ups. Good ways to do Good that. ways yeah. to actually get more energy. Just wanna say I love veggie burgers. And they're, they're great, right? Yes, but But are. listen, if you like beef, you can have beef in the book. Listen, all the recipes are simple and easy. Each day is spelled out for you, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, and you can swap out as you want to. Okay, week three. Week three is important because this is the breakout week. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some beef here, we have our vegetables as you see. And That's the reason great. why people like week three is because this is when you start noticing a change. Huh? Most people will say to you, are you doing something different? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you're breaking out. You yes. typically drop maybe a size, a dress mm -hmm. size, you start feeling good, and now you're well into the program. Awesome, okay, and oh, and I even see some that's right. Some, absolutely, because this the plan is realistic. I'm not asking you to, yeah. to, to eat foods that and you never know, look at something that, again. Absolutely. Who's gonna live their life without having some Tell sweets? Tell me this is good, please. It is wonderful. Oh good. This is air pop popcorn. <laughs> Try to buy air pop popcorn. It's great. Low in calories, and it's a whole grain, it has all three parts of the grain. There are tons of snacks in the book as well as 45 recipes. So you don't have to go hungry. No, right. you never and people people say actually there's too much to eat sometimes. Yeah. Which is a good thing, right? Right. So um, the, also in the book we have, with the recipes and the snacks, I have swap outs. Mm -hmm. So if you want to swap things out, for example, if you like Snickers, yeah. 27 grams divided by four, four. it's about <laughs> seven teaspoons yeah. just in that Snickers. Ooh. But instead of that, you can have the Nutella on, on some toast, on okay. some whole wheat, whole grain toast. That's good. Um, this is very important. Look at this, this um, yogurt. People tend to buy yogurt with fruit on the bottom. Yes. Don't do that. Yeah. It tastes great, but guess what? Sugar, Tons sugar, of sugar. sugar. 30 yeah. grams of sugar in some of these yogurts. So instead, get the plain yogurt and add your fresh berries and fruit. Which gives the sweetness. Still get your sweetness, but much less sugar. Okay. Even your salad dressing. So let's look real fast here. So this salad dressing has 
Uh, blah, 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 blah. So you can do the yeah, glasses. Yeah. So, I can't help so, yeah. so this is actually not a bad salad dressing. Only has a gram of sugar in it. But really? some have 10 or 12 grams of sugar. So your swap out for salad dressing is use some olive oil. And you can get wonderfully flavored olive oils. Absolutely. Now that are really Put a little delicious. pepper, yeah. maybe a little salt. Mm -hmm. um, so these are important swap outs, as well as you know your cashews. Take your cashews out, replace them with walnuts. Is it a big ah. difference? Not a big difference, but remember, small changes yield yes. big differences. And it's the combination, I'm sure, of all of these things. It, it, it may seem small with each individual choice, but it's all adding up to something wonderful for you. You know what's interesting? We have a Facebook group called Sugar Blasters, so people at home should join our Facebook group. And people are posting the changes really? that they're seeing. And by the way, this is not just a plan for diabetics or pre-diabetics, it's for everyone. People are losing weight up to 20 pounds mm -hmm. in five weeks. They're dropping their blood sugars by 30%. But more importantly, they're breaking their addiction because sugar is so addictive. It really and they're is. posting recipes and workouts. So it really is about a lifestyle change, not just something that's yeah. trendy. And actually, while you might not feel like working out now, when you get rid of the lethargy that comes after the sugar high, you probably are willing Absolutely. to do something. Absolutely. And people yeah. have said that after being on the plan for five weeks, they've actually gone back to try to eat some of the things that they've eaten before or, or, mm -hmm. or drink. It's too sweet. Yes. Because your body is. actually reacclimates yeah. and says, I don't want all this sugar anymore. You know, we've been talking about the plan, and the plan is in your book. I want to mention this, Blast the Sugar Out. You know, I, I felt like, I, I admit, I'm a sugar ad addict, and so I'm, so I'm adhering to your plan. I'm going to start this because today I felt like in my quiet time, the Lord said the reason you're not having success is you don't have a plan. Mm. You know, you can be well-intentioned, you can talk about it all you want, but if you don't have a plan, you're not going to have success. So blast the sugar out. It's available nationwide. Dr. Ian Smith with us again with some life-changing information. Thank you so Good much, you, my huh? friend. You too. All right. It's a wonderful book, and we all need to get on it. So let's do that and get on the website as okay, well. Absolutely. All right? It's a deal. Well, still ahead, the six-time Grammy nominee who says her greatest work is done outside a recording studio. We're going to talk with singer Natalie Grant later on today's show. But first, we'll take you to a place that's a safe haven for children in an area where poverty and crime are rampant. Watch as lives are changed. That's all coming up next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A federal court ruling now gives Arkansas the power to cut off funding to Planned Parenthood. The new decision overturns a previous ruling that forced the state to hand over Medicaid funding to the abortion giant. Arkansas's governor had severed ties to the abortion provider. That after videos exposed Planned Parenthood officials discussing the illegal sale of aborted baby parts. A new study shows most Americans agree they are sinners, but disagree on what to do about it. LifeWay research found that 67% of Americans believe they are sinful, but only a quarter of Americans say they rely on Jesus to overcome their sin. A third of Americans say they're working on becoming less sinful themselves. 10% of Americans believe sin doesn't exist or that they are not guilty of sin at all. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Terry, we'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, school is starting up around the country, and it's in session on the other side of the world as well. In one community in Africa, children are attending preschool, and thanks to Orphan's Promise, they're getting a lot more than just an education. Aliswa is five years old. His mother died from AIDS when he was two, and his father was never in the picture. He lives with an aunt who beats him, forces him to work, and doesn't let him eat at the family table. His home life is filled with rejection. The brightest part of his day is connecting with his teacher and friends at this preschool, sponsored by Orphan's Promise. He eats nutritious meals, sometimes the only food he'll get all day. The center is located in this African slum community of more than 18,000 impoverished people. 60% are unemployed. 
Many are involved in substance abuse and crime, and the children wander aimlessly and unsupervised. Orphan's Promise sponsors 15 preschools in this community, involving more than 400 at-risk children. The program is so much more than ABCs and 123s. This is the one place Aliswa feels loved and accepted. He's learning typical preschool things, but there's a sparkle in his eyes because this teacher is fulfilling his need for nurture, an important childhood building block he doesn't get at home. Aliswa is shy but his teachers say he's not sad like he used to be. And he's beginning to learn he can trust people. Unconditional love is having a big impact in this little boy's life. Seven-year-old Taliswa is left alone most of the day. Her mother is usually drunk and emotionally unavailable. This little girl has a secret she has not been able to share. She often comes to this preschool supported by Orphan's Promise. And on this day, the teacher was reading a Bible story about Joseph being in prison. When she asked the children if they had experienced any tough situations, Thaliswa began to cry. She didn't share then, but later when the children were playing outside, she told the teacher her secret. She had been raped by a man in the community, not once, but twice. The teacher talked with her, prayed for her, and then called child services. Legal action was taken against the man, and he was arrested. With counseling, Toliswa is getting back to the happy child she used to be. Thankfully, someone was standing in the gap to intervene for this precious girl. Kids can overcome lots of adversity, poverty, hunger, even loss. But abandonment leaves a terrible emotional scar. Since he was a baby, Sifamandia's mother was usually on drugs and would leave him for days at a nearby preschool or creche. The woman in charge became known affectionately as his creche mama. He told us, I know she loves me because she treats me just like her own son. Sifamandia is now nine. He still sees his biological mom in the community and even stays with her sometimes. But the love and support he receives from his crush mama has helped him remain in school and steadfast in his goals. He wants to become a doctor so he can help people who are hurting. We really believe he will break the cycle, leave the slum community, and become a successful, healthy adult. In at-risk communities like this, the teachers at our Orphans Promise sponsored programs are a lifeline. Standing in the gap, nurturing and encouraging, being used by God to give purpose and a future to children who had been lost and without hope. And their color is orange. Breaking the cycle of poverty and abuse is what Orphans Promise is all about. We want to take at risk and orphan children from at risk to thriving, vulnerable children who have no voice in their communities, in their families sometimes. We want to say thank you to those of you who are making this possible. These creches that you just saw are just available right now in South Africa, but we're working in more than 60 countries. In South Africa, we're hand in hand with a powerful church who's there every day, helping to train the teachers, giving them an opportunity and an option to be in fellowship with believers. Listen, you're making a difference around the world. We wanna raise up a generation of kids who've broken free from the cycle that they've been in so that they can serve the Lord with all their hearts and lead their countries with righteousness. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can join the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. If you'd like to designate your gift to Orphan's Promise, go ahead and do that. But everything that CBN is doing around the world is making a difference in the lives of people by setting them free with the knowledge of God's love. So you'll be a part of that now. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to be a part of what CBN's doing around the world. And we say thank you in advance. Well, coming up, she is an award-winning singer and a modern-day abolitionist. 
I'll never forget meeting this girl who uh, was sold on her 12th birthday by her own parents. She took my hands and she just said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Natalie Grant takes a stand against human trafficking when we come back. At one point in Natalie Grant's career, she couldn't sing, she couldn't even speak. In fact, the five-time female vocalist of the year was told by doctors that she wasn't even allowed to whisper. Well, oddly enough, that's when Natalie found her true voice. Take a look. Award-winning artist Natalie Grant is one of the most recognized names in contemporary Christian music. But in 2004, she says she found a purpose that goes beyond her music career. The irony is it has very little to do with singing. Singing is what I do. It's not who I am. She says the journey to discovering her passion started while watching the TV show Law & Order. The episode was about human trafficking. I just remember that TV show always saying that they were ripped from the headlines, right? And I'm thinking, what headline is this? They were literally depicting kids being sold out of the back of a van in New York City. Like, this is the most innocent among us. But I just remember thinking, if this is actually happening somewhere in the world, uh, I need to know about it, and, and, and a lot of other people need to know about it too. So she made plans to travel to India, the area many consider to be the epicenter of human trafficking. But two days before the trip, one of her vocal cords ruptured. They're like, you may never sing again. You cannot speak, hum, whisper. You can't utter a single sound for at least 30 days. And I'm leaving to India. Voiceless, she went anyway. I'll never forget meeting this girl who uh, was sold on her 12th birthday by her own parents rescued when she was 21, so for nine years she was trafficked. She knew one thing that she did uh, know in English that she could say to me that I would understand. She took my hands and she just said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. She thought, okay, I can't go into all of my story in English, but when I say this name, you're gonna know that everything's been made right. I came here trying to learn how I could rescue them. And these who have so much brokenness showed me that Jesus does his best work through our broken pieces. When you can't make a sound and all you can do is just lean on God and listen, it is amazing what happens. In 2005, Natalie co-founded the nonprofit Hope for Justice, whose mission is to bring an end to human trafficking by rescuing victims, restoring lives, and reforming society. Hope for Justice, which hard to believe that just started as a little dream off of meeting those girls in India is now on three different continents and four different countries with six different offices. So it's amazing when you use your voice to do what God has placed inside of you. We can be the change, be the hope, yeah. Now the artist, wife, mother, and businesswoman hopes to help other women find God's calling in their own lives in her book, Finding Your Voice. In it, she shares her own journey through bulimia, infertility, self-doubt, and depression to find her identity in Christ and God's purpose in her life. And it starts with God's Word. And all throughout the book, from start to finish, it's full of my story, yes, but more than that, it's through, it's full of biblical examples because the foundation to finding your voice is the Word of God. Natalie says ultimately a personal relationship with God will give women the confidence to live their passion out loud. And my prayer is that every person that reads the book uh, when they put it down, their takeaway would be finding their identity in who Christ says that they are, discovering that personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that His view, what He sees, seeing ourselves through the lens of Christ and His grace over our life, begins to change every aspect of our life. It will strengthen our marriage. It will strengthen our ability to parent. It will strengthen our friendships. It strengthens everything about our life. And when you can 
find your voice and first understanding His voice over your life, you know, I think that's my prayer, is that every person who reads it would have a greater understanding of who they are in Christ. And I think that understanding changes everything. Natalie Grant's book is called Finding Your Voice. It's available in stores nationwide. And if you want to know more about her nonprofit, Hope for Justice, go to CBN.com. We have more information for you there. Well, up next, she flipped her car, saw everything go black, and woke up surrounded in flames. I said, oh my God, I'm in hell and I deserve this. See how she was literally snatched from death. That's next. For a time, Grace Gonzalez thought the world would be better off if she were dead. Grace certainly believed that she would be better off if she weren't alive. But that changed one night when Grace OD'd and got a glimpse of her eternity. Honestly, I wasn't happy living. I don't want to be alive if I'm living in this world just struggling day to day and not accomplishing anything. I'm going to get in my car and whatever happens, happens. I don't want to be alive. Life had always been a painful road for Grace Gonzalez. Her childhood left her feeling worthless. My grandfather was a drug dealer and gang leader. My grandmother was also a maid by day, but then she would spend her nights in the bars. My dad, I just remember him being out a lot. And my mom was always, she was just always too busy. Then her sister Gabriella drowned when Grace was just six. Right before we found her floating in a creek, I have a memory of her coming up to me and asking if she could play with me and the other kids. And I told her no, because I felt that she was too small and I just wanted to be with the older kids. I felt guilty and I felt angry at myself. So I quickly learned as a child to shut myself off to those feelings and to not feel anything at all. But the feelings were still there, eating away at her spirit. So at age 12, Grace started using drugs and alcohol. By her mid-teens, she was an addict. From the time I was small, I quickly um, felt that I could do no right, especially after the death of my sister. And then growing up, I just felt that every time I did something wrong, whether it was my fault or not, I got punished for it. If this is the life that is destined for me to live, then I'm going to give it all I got. By the time I was 25 years old, I was either going to be dead or be in prison for a really long time. And I was okay with that. I felt that I didn't have any value. Grace was kicked out of high school at 16 for drug abuse and left her chaotic home. For the next six years, she lived on the streets, landing in jail multiple times for stealing or dealing drugs. Though Grace had heard about God, she doubted he existed. I would hope that there was really a God and that he was real. I would actually, I guess, call out to him and I would tell him, you took the wrong one, meaning you took the wrong sister because I'm not doing anything meaningful with my life. I'm a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic, I'm on the streets, I'm hurting people, I'm hurting myself. One night when Grace was 22, she overdosed. She later awoke, angry to be alive. Grace then sped off in her car, hoping to end it all. I remember feeling so angry and hurt and hopeless and I might die, and that's okay. I didn't care. It was just about 20 minutes after that I wrecked. I started flipping on the freeway, and then everything went black. A bystander rushed to help and dragged her out of the car. Flames 
surrounding me, I felt a fear in my heart and in my mind that I had never felt before. I said, oh my God, I'm in hell and I deserve this. And that next moment, a hand or a arm reached in from behind me and snatched me out of there. And when I woke up, I was in an ambulance being worked on by paramedics. And I thought, I have to give this God a chance. And I said, God help me. But when I said it, I meant it. And that's it, I was out again. I woke up 10 hours later by myself in a hospital room next to an open window. The sun was shining in. And when I woke up and saw that, I felt as if I literally saw Jesus. And that filled me with hope. And because you saved my life, now you can have it. That was just the first step of a long journey for Grace. Her leg was badly mangled in the accident, leaving her wheelchair bound. Though she began to read the Bible and listen to Christian music, she was still addicted. After two years, doctors said amputating her leg was the only option due to infection. A few days later, when I went back to the hospital, they said, we don't know what happened, but your infection is gone. You will walk again. That gave me the hope, and I made a decision right there in myself that said, I can trust God. Grace could now let God take full control of her life. With her leg healed, she also overcame her addictions. Soon, she enrolled in Texas Bible Institute. As she drew closer to God, she felt His love wash away the pain and guilt she carried for so many years. My heart was different. I was no longer filled with anger. I was no longer filled with hurt. That had been replaced by gratefulness. I am the happiest I have ever been. And I feel like I want people so badly to get it, that this hope is available and attainable for everyone, and His name is Jesus. Boy, it is available. It's available to each and every one of us. You know, I think the sad thing about the story of Grace's life and so many of our lives is that we were created to live in a garden with God. I mean, it was beautiful. Everything was perfect. And by our own hand, we chose to go our own way. We chose to make our own decisions. And we've been left with the consequences of that ever since. In Grace's scenario, she was told some lies by the enemy. Don't think there's not an enemy out there trying to ruin your future, take your inheritance, snuff out your life. The lie is, you're guilty, Grace. You're guilty of all of this. You're a victim of all of this. You get what you deserve. Listen, none of us get what we deserve. We all deserve death. Why do you think Jesus went to the cross? Because He loves you. He loves you just the way you are. Hard to understand, I know. I don't understand why He loves me either, but He does. The question isn't God's issue. The question is ours. Are you willing to find out more about who He is? Are you willing to be loved? Are you willing to do what Grace did, to trust Him? to love you more than you even love yourself. That's the bottom line of the deal. God's arms are stretched out. I believe that's why Jesus was nailed to a cross, so our picture of him would be his arms out wide, making a path, making a way for you and me to come home. Listen today, don't make that grace a cheap thing by turning your back on it. Understand that it was paid for you. That price was paid for you and for me. This is what God's Word says. When He forgives our sin, great as it may be, He forgives it as far as the east is from the west, and get this, remembers it no more. So that voice in you that keeps reminding you of who you are, of your shortcomings, of your sin, of your addiction, of your failings and your fallings, Speak to that voice and say, no, no, I'm going to listen to who God says I am. I'm a child of God redeemed by the blood of Jesus, set free because of his sacrifice, filled with the Holy Spirit to live life differently. That's your inheritance. Don't walk away from that. 
If you'd like to pray with someone today, we always have friends standing by on our phones. You know, prayer is just conversing with God. Find out what it means to belong to him, to choose to say yes to his forgiveness, to his mercy and grace, to his filling you with the kind of power that changes your life. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. If you decide to make a commitment to Christ in your life today, ask for the New Day Packet. It's free also, and it'll share with you, how do I live this new life? Now that I've prayed this prayer, how do I walk this out? A new day was put together with you in mind, and it's yours when you call and ask for it. The phone call's free, so is the packet. We want to leave you today with words from Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Those are great words for all of us. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you again tomorrow on The 700 Club.